This is the Attacking Duo Show with Jake Murphy, Dean Cox and Kevin Lisby. This is a Jake Murphy Media Production. Well, hello and welcome to Series 1, Episode 2 of the Attacking Duo Show, hosted by myself, Dean Cox and Kevin Lisby. And in this second episode, we are joined by Charlie Daniels. Now, firstly, before we go into Charlie's career and talk about some uh, topical points in football, this episode will be released on Tuesday, uh, up rather than Saturday, because of the social media blackout in football. So I just kind of want to get your guys' opinions on, obviously, this movement. And do you think it's anywhere near enough to stop these trolls of abuse of all kinds? No, I, yeah, I think I think it's gonna. I think it's a start, but un, until the powers that be on the social media front actually start making people accountable for their actions, then you can protest as much as much as you want. But unless they actually step up to the plate and and make themselves accountable, then you know things things need to be done because it is just too much going on now. It's, it's got to a stage where it's, I mean, you can have a protest now, but next week people will still have the platform to abuse people online. So whether, whether having a blackout for four days is going to make a big difference, it's, it's definitely addressing the situation, but social media platforms need to, need to do more. And you've all, obviously, Charlie, you've played in the Premier League with Bournemouth. Kevin, you played in the Premier League with Charlton, the highest levels of football within the English game. Have any of you kind of experienced abuse, be that from away fans or stuff like that on social media? And if so, how long do you feel this has been going on for? Um, and me, me personally, I think not face on face racial abuse. I've got the ignorant comments um, sometimes from my own teammates. Um, it's just, it's just being a little bit more aware, a little bit, have a little bit of knowledge and understanding about how, how you can make someone feel regarding the comments you make. Um, ignorance is, is massive with, with racism, I feel. Um, regarding this, obviously this blackout we're dealing with at the moment, it's, it's quite scary how to catch some of these social media companies are from this whole incident. There's no face to anything. No one comes out and speaks about it. Um, so, I mean, me personally, I won't be doing it because um, I can't see, the, I don't see the need of doing it, to be honest. Um, I'm hoping with everyone putting as much effort in as they are, that there is some sort of change. But at the moment, it's so minimal that it's, it's really hard to see through what's going on at the moment. And I guess as footballers and obviously people, the public in general, what do you feel needs to be done in terms of these social media accounts? Uh, in terms of signing up, should there be passports to sign up to accounts? Because at the moment, any of us four could go and set up 55 accounts on Twitter with the same email address. Should you need ID to actually register and be limited to one account per person? I think so. I think that's the only way, isn't it? I think if people are, have got their name to that account, then they're, they're like Charlie said, they're, they're held accountable for, you know, whatever tweets they put on there. And then obviously if, you know, they decide to be stupid... Uh, you know, that they, they can be uh, prosecuted and, and dealt with in the right way. But at the moment, you can make an account now. I could stick a picture of an egg as my profile picture and, and say what the hell I like. And until you stop that, then, like Kevin said, I mean, I, 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 I did put it on my social media just because I think it does highlight it. But I think it's only going to highlight it for the weekend. And then, you know, come 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 next week, we're, we're back where we were. But I think it's a start. But there's a lot, a long, long way to go. A long, long way. Now, uh, kind of moving on to obviously our guest Charlie Daniels. Now, Charlie and Dean, you made up one of the best left sides, if not the best left sides in Leighton Orient history, in my opinion. Anyway, uh, you seemed like you had a great rapport on the pitch. Now, a little was bit Cox about the left side. Why Cox, he was playing everywhere. He went left side. He freaking ill. <laughs> <laughs> The only fact that let me just go anywhere I wanted. Yeah, I'm left back. Just let me track that. I've done that. <laughs> Cheers, Dad. Oh. Now, now, a little bit about Charlie's um, kind of career. Uh, so, Charlie started at Ridgeway Rovers, went to Winterwood. Obviously, this is his youth career. Norwich.
Norwich City and then was at Tottenham Hotspur. Uh, 2005-2009, he was part of the Tottenham first, Hotspur first team set up. 2007, he had a loan move to Chesterfield. 2007-8, he spent a season on loan at Leighton Orient, making 31 appearances. In Gillingham, he made five in 2008 on loan. Before moving the O's, moving to the O's, should I say, permanently in 2009 to 2012. And then kind of the big move, which was initially a loan move, but then in to Bournemouth in League One at the time, I believe, 2012 to 2020. 244 appearances for Bournemouth, having made fifth, scoring 15 goals, including one of the best goals I've probably ever seen coming against Man City, which we put out on our social media. Then went to Shrewsbury, having played 14 games, scoring one goal, and is currently at Portsmouth. So, first of all, Charlie, let's just talk kind of about your early days and your career and those early days of kind of at Tottenham. How was it being a youngster at Tottenham at the time? Yeah, it was a great, it was a great learning curve. You know, uh, there's so many players that come through that academy have gone on to play professional football. Uh, the coaching that you get and uh, just the whole setup, you know, it was everything's geared for you to, to be a professional footballer. And it was not only on the pitch, but off the pitch as well. Uh, the mental side to get you prepared for, for playing, uh, say, men's football. Obviously, you had your loan spells, including one at Orion, like we mentioned. But then you moved to Leighton Orion in uh, 2009, which was your first kind of real club you spent yeah. a lot of time at as a senior. What were your memories of that time at Leighton Orion? Obviously, we got the famous trip to Vegas. You obviously played against Arsenal. Um, which I remember reading in the programme at Arsenal away, you used to get both Arsenal and Tottenham kits as a child, didn't you? Yeah. So who, who is it you actually supported growing up, or was it kind of both but slightly? Uh, yeah, I no, no, like, half, half my family, oh, no, none of them. Half my family is Arsenal, half of my family is Spurs. Uh, to be honest, I never used to watch it growing up. Uh, it wasn't, it wasn't really on. I just, just enjoyed playing it, and then. Uh, you know, you, then you start, you get to an age, you're about, what, nine, ten. You start getting, you know, Sky Sports has, has just e exploded. And then I started, I think in the season I first started watching football was probably when Newcastle should have won the league. Yeah. Was it 94, 95, 95, 96, something like that. Uh, and for me, I just love the way that they played in terms of the free flow and attacking football, you know, and, and the fans just so uh, passionate. Uh, so I, I ended up supporting, I support Newcastle growing up. So following them, like Ginola, Aspria, Shearer, players like that, just the entertainers really. Uh, so then that got me in the wrong books for both sides of my family. So uh, <laughs> yeah, that wasn't great. But uh, yeah, so that's, that's, that's how I got into football. You say I'd, I just enjoyed playing it whenever whenever I could. I was always outside, uh, whether it was in the street, on the park, in the park, uh, or playing for the team. And um, at that time at Leighton Orient, obviously, Coxie, you played um, behind, or well, in front of Charlie, as uh, Kevin said, sometimes when you, you'd be all over the place. But joking aside, how was your relationship on the pitch, Charlie and Dean? Because it's like Kevin joked, you had that licence to move forward, Dean going to different spots. Charlie, you linked up well. How well? Uh, how good is it to have that connection on the pitch? Um, to be fair, I mean, he's the best left back I've I've obviously played with, for sure. He just knew where to be. I didn't have to say anything, really. If I ran off, he, he wasn't really one to say get back. He was quite comfortable being left 1v1. Some defenders, you know, like to have that extra bit of cover, but he backed himself. Uh, and obviously, going forward, he used to do my running. <laughs> so basically, Coxie used to stand still, and then I used to run past him, and then I used to run past him on the way back as well. <laughs> I'll get it cut inside. Come on, Jazz, hurry up! Can't hold on, come on. And then, uh, yeah, but it was just one of them that just clicked really. And I mean, we had we had we had some great, great, great joy with with, with the way we played, and uh, I think that sort of uh, set the you know normal fullbacks in League Two, League One would be just there and kick it down the channel. I think at that point, the game has sort of changed a little bit and, and the more overlaps were expected, thankfully enough for me. Um, so, yeah, I mean, like I said, it was a dream because I could I could come inside, 
he'd always look to get me on the ball. You know, if I hadn't had the ball, he'd always get it and, you know, try his best to get it to me because he probably knows I'll probably start moaning or put my hands over my hips or I'll be shouting at someone, come on, for Christ's sake, what's going on? Um, so, yeah, and then obviously he's gone on and, and, and listen, I, he's been fantastic. I mean, the goal against Man City is ridiculous. Um, so, you know, fair play to you, Chaz. You, you went on and, I mean, you're still playing, to be fair. fair, fair yeah, you kept yourself yeah. fit and, 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 and playing for a long time. But, yeah, you, you know, you, you've, you've lived the dream that I would have loved to. So, well done, mate. Oh, cheers. I think we had a, I think not only just us, but I think we had a good, a good setup. You know, I think Slady actually set up a good team. You know, we, we played like a lopsided formation uh, a lot with two strikers. And uh, I remember one when we had Wingy as a right back. And he used, yeah. to fly up and down. he used to fly up and down. Uh, and I think we always used to play Dawson in that false, false seven position, really. And uh, yeah, it just worked, you know. And say we, we, we used to link up really well. And they would Coxie go inside, and I used to make an overlap, and he never used to pass it to me and then cross it and get all the answers. So it was. <laughs> Yeah, no, sorry, Chaz, sorry, mate. That's right, mate. I think I think it worked out. Obviously, um, the 2010-2011 season that we alluded to earlier uh, was the FA Cup run, uh, which finalised with a uh, 5-0 defeat at the Emirates against Arsenal, following a one-all draw with a late Jonathan to who a goal. Let's kind of look at the team from that season, though. We all know what we what happened. It's been spoke about in terms of, obviously, the games and the results. But the players like Paul Joshi and Poku we had on loan, Tommy Carroll, of course, Harry Kane. We, Scott McGleish was still scoring goals for fun, like you say, Stephen Dawson, yourself, Jimmy Smith. We had a really good core of a squad. Um, what kind of made that group special and believe that they could go on and get results against Arsenal, albeit a draw at home? For me, I think, I, think from, <laughs> I, think, yeah, I think it comes from the manager for me. You know, Slady was so, he's just, he's got so much energy. And he was always in and around the lads. He always, he always wanted the best from the lads. And I mean, nearly before every game, it was, the message was stay in the game for as long as possible. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and we would get a, a good number of chances just through just staying in the game, staying behind the ball. You know, nullifying their threats, and we we was always good for a chance. And you know, the strikers that we had, in saying it, getting them low moves in. I mean, Paul, Paul and Polko had the best chop I've ever seen. When he, I mean, if you saw it against Drosden, is it Drosden that we played in? The, yeah, in the we, yeah, I remember. I mean, yeah, that, yeah, yeah. That was crazy. That that, mm. that kind of game. Two all uh, full time, one eight two in extra time, didn't yeah. we? Yeah, I mean that was crazy. I mean his chop was just ridiculous. Uh, and he got uh, the right back off. And they say, like, Tommy Carroll coming in used to get us playing. Uh, obviously, Harry's Harry's phenomenal striker. Even, even at that, that age, you could see the potential that he had. But not only that, we had we had some great characters. Obviously, we, got, we had Coxie, Jimmy Smith, Danny Jones. Uh, I think we had Chores then, didn't we? Chorley. Yeah. I mean, we had some big, we had some big characters. Forbes, yeah, still. Forbesy, yeah, yeah, Forbesy. Forbesy, oh, love Forbesy. Oh. You know, great characters and always, they always wanted the best out of the team. There was never, never any egos. It was all, it was all for the team, uh, and just loved playing for Leighton Orient and 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 loved playing for the, the manager as well. And obviously, from the O's, you went on to that loan spell to Bournemouth, which was then made permanent. We spent yeah. eight years going from League One to Premier League football. When you joined Bournemouth, did you see the vision at the club that one day they would be a Premier League club and that you'd be part of that? Well, that was the dream that was sold to me uh, by Lee Bradbury, who was a manager at the time. Uh, they'd just been taken over, I think, in the October. And they were looking to, obviously, go into the Championship. They wanted to go into the Championship and get established, basically, in the a, in a Championship. Uh, and Maxim, the owner, that was, that was his vision to get up there as, as quick as possible. And the first half, well, when I first went there, unfortunately, Lee Bradbury assembled a great team 
but things just, the results just didn't happen. Uh, and then going into the following season, uh, we have Paul Groves, who was manager, and uh, and that just it just didn't work in the terms of the way that he 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 worked. It just didn't suit our our team, and I think a couple of signings that he made just didn't didn't suit the group or didn't add to the group. And then yeah, then Eddie Howe come back in in the October, and then everything just changed from there. Well, see, Eddie Howe's one of the most renowned English young football managers there is in the game. And kind of questions have been said, should he join Tottenham? Would he ever go to Tottenham? Would the job be too big for him? As someone that's played under him, do you think Tottenham would be a right suit for him at this time? Yeah, yeah, I do. Uh, I mean, he's been linked with every club so far. I mean, any, any club that he will go into, people don't see how uh, intense he is. With his with his training, with his setup, uh, I mean, if people see him in the media, he's got he's got a very good way about him. You know, he's very he's very good in the media the way he speaks. But when it's when he's on the pitch, when he's on the training field, you know, he's very intense. He's very he's very demanding of his players. Uh, and he, if he does get wherever he does get the job, you know, he's going to be he's going to put his his ideas forward. And uh, all I know is that. From my uh, from my knowledge of him is that wherever he goes, he's going to be attacking football, uh, exciting football because that's the way that's his philosophy. That's the way he likes to play. Uh, so I think any any fan would would welcome it. Now the one big question I want to talk about is we know it's not happening as they thought it would do, uh, but is the whole Super League saga and situation as players yourself? What's your opinions on it? Would you have wanted to be involved playing in a Super League, per se? And do you think that in the future, something like this might sadly actually go ahead? Uh, I mean, it's just... With, there's no promotion, relegation. It's it's kind of a, a meaningless cup. You know what I mean? It's... it's the fans' reaction, everyone's reaction, is just how how football's not dead, but it's, it's, it seems like it's going that way. Because when you when you grow up as a youngster, they Kevin and Coxie, you know, it's every time you score a goal, so you the kid, every time you score a goal, the feeling wasn't the ball hitting the back of the net. You didn't hear the ball but hear the back of the net. You didn't hear your your, your teammates screaming. It was the it was the fans cheering. It was a scream of the fans. And if we have this super league and say no fans want it and it's it's gonna go down that road, it's it's gonna take all the essential things out of football. I mean you, I mean, you look at now with no fans in the crowd it's 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 so bad, you know. It's all the emotion, a lot of emotion, is out is out of football at the minute. And you you're watching you're watching football now, and you you just miss you miss the crowd. I mean, you saw the the cup final, even though there was eight thousand people, the difference that that made was incredible. I thought. I was I'm, I was still trying to work out whether or not they were looking to do it without fans. I mean, there's so many things going on, but. I can't get my head around how they they thought they were gonna do this without without fans. I really can't understand them. I think that's the, probably the most outrageous thing about this whole thing is they was actually looking to cut all fans out of football. Um, you forget the the competitive side and and winning and losing and getting relegated, but football's about fans. And yeah. I, can't, I couldn't get couldn't quite understand how they were looking to have a a league, a tournament, or whatever you want to call it. Without fans, um, yeah. which is yeah. which is really worrying. The fact that they they were even considering that. Yeah, I'm after uh, is it that it was, it was supposed to be marketed for the market, is that right or yeah is that what I mean for Asian? It is the disrespect that the owners have had towards and the fans. 
and the players and the staff. I mean, for not telling them. The players and the clubs have had to face the questions and to not be addressed by the owners or the chief execs or whoever is involved. I think it's very, very disappointing. I think there's probably something called that will now have a say in certain matters in clubs now. That's pushing for it at the moment. And I think it's only right, a bit like Germany, that if you have people can what happens in a some if it's too hold on. I mean, players that happen, but I think something's going to change because obviously with COVID and all sorts, you, you read about how much clubs have lost money. I'm sure they're going to have to recoup it somehow. So, uh, you know, whether it be the way they... Yeah. I just don't know where, where they're going to play these games as well, especially and the, the new Champions League format. Just so many oh, yeah, games. I don't see how you're going to put that, fit that in the football. It, it, that's why I, it, it could never have happened because it was just, you know, how many games have they got already? So then go and throw another separate league uh, and they're not playing some national football. I mean, come on. Yeah. It, 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 I mean, uh, the bloke at Real Madrid, he thinks it's going to happen. You're, I mean, going, to need a, you're going to need a massive squad, aren't you? Like, well, that's what yeah, I mean. Like, exactly. yeah, yeah. The only standard squad. The only yeah. good thing that's come out of it is like obviously myself getting back in the game if, if they need more players. <laughs> yeah, no, no, yeah, it's true, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and kind of following on from that Super League saga, um, it has caused protest, it's caused people of these top mm. six clubs, some of them wanting their owners out. One big story that hit a couple of days ago is the Spotify owner, uh, Daniel Ek, lifelong Arsenal fan from Sweden, wants to actually buy Arsenal Football Club alongside with the players of Henri and Bergkamp, etc. in their custodian. He's got the funds. The, uh, the club are adamant they don't want to sell the club. If you are the Cronkies, are you selling Arsenal Football Club at a place where you probably know that you're no longer wanted. 1.8 billion. Thanks very much. See you later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but they've they, 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 they tried their best. They've yeah. tried their best and they can't take it. I think with that takeover, isn't uh, Vieira, is it Burkamp and someone else? Henri. Henri. So listen, these guys know the club. They know the DNA. You know, and obviously with that back in, the bloke's obviously caked. So... You'd like to think recruitment would then be a lot better because yeah. Arsenal's recruitment's been shambles. I think I think it's shambles. Good for Arsenal football club, yeah. I think it'd be good for Arsenal football club if it does get taken over. Hundred percent. But yeah. Cronky's not even in the country, is he? Let's be honest. He's he's not facing this. He's wherever he is in California or America, and uh, he's not picking up a paper or reading the news. You know what I mean? Yeah. He's 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 well out of it. So unless the fans and the people maybe a little bit above get involved, then he's in no he's in no pressure really to to sell because I say he's not he's not even in the country. It's so really unless... worrying times for Arsenal to yeah. be honest. I think it's really worrying times. Um, if you look at it, if, if if the takeover doesn't happen and these guys actually stay, I don't think the fans are going to be happy. And I can see a lot of protests going on throughout the whole season. And then you look at Arsenal's squad, not good enough. Um, the manager um, is still a little bit debating whether or not he's good enough. You look at his tactics yesterday, and I think he got it a little bit wrong. I think not playing a striker. So there's going to be so many question marks over Arsenal's future, whether or not it's the manager, player, owner, that actually, if you're a player yourself, then you, you know what it's like, Charles, um, even you, Coxie. If, if you had an option to go to Arsenal or somewhere else with all this going on, you're not going to choose Arsenal, the, the bigger and better players. So it's actually quite worrying as an Arsenal supporter at the moment. 
Yeah. yeah, I don't think, I think it's can... worrying, but then yeah. I think what they can use this t- new takeover, it'll be exciting. I think obviously with the money he's got with those three legends that will be, you know, well, they've got to take hall. over first, haven't they? Yeah, I think it's yeah. essential that they, they have to if the, if the club's going to start moving forward again. Yeah, 100%. And as we get into the last 10 minutes of the show, uh, a question I want to ask you guys and put to you as well is the whole debate of will Harry Kane be moving from Tottenham this season? Of course he will. Tips that he's going to go to Man City, but obviously Cox, you already said he will. Do you think it'll be... I don't know if he goes to Man City. Don't quote me on that. But listen, he he has been loyal. He has stuck by him. He has scored goals consistently. The boy wants to win... Trophies and 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 the be all end all he will not at, at Tottenham and you know listen he's he's stayed I mean he could have gone to, a year ago two years ago he's stayed but I think the time is now he has to move this summer he's such a good player I mean he must when he plays he gets them out the S H I T so many times and they can see stupid goals you know to be fair look they got to the cup final I didn't think he was great on the day but um. He's, it's like it's near enough a one-man show there and if I was him I'd be getting sick of it and uh, you know if, if Man City and, and, and the likes of that are looking at him then come on you know it's not about money with Harry he, he wants medals and, and he's not going to get them at Tottenham he needs to move I think the only worrying thing is you can't replace him um, if you sell him it's going to have to be for a lot of money then you're looking at probably bringing in four players I think I'll be honest with you with that squad they've got right now, if you sell Harry Kane, you can't just bring in another striker because you're not going to get a, a, another striker like him. So you're almost going to have to almost change the way you play. Um, and you're almost going to have to bring in four players. And I think that's the worrying bit. And I think Tottenham in general, if you look at the way they took the club set up, new stadium and that, if they get rid of Harry Kane now, what are the fans going to be like? Um, the players out there, they're not going to go Tottenham. Any, any decent player now is not going to go Tottenham. So it's going to be really similar to Arsenal. It's going to be really worrying times for Tottenham next year. Um, I think if they get in the Champions League, which I think they've still got a good chance, I think they might be able to keep him. But if he goes, it's, I think they'll be in real big problems, I think. I just think if if he does go, then I could see Sun going as well. And maybe a couple yeah. more. Yeah, that, that was the other thing. There'll be a knock-on of yeah. effect. Yeah, Sun, yeah, exactly. That's, that. that's the only worry, yeah. But I think there's quite an aging squad as well, isn't it? Yeah, I think there's definitely conversations being had. Um, hey, if you're Harry Payne, what are you doing? But me? Um, no, me? Kev. <laughs> yeah, yeah, go on, Kev. What are you doing? What do you hey, mean, hey, football guys? You know what I mean? If, as a footballer, we, we, you know, he's got a chance to go, yeah, OK, if it's Man City, you're, you're near enough guaranteed the Premier League title. He's got to go. The only he? thing I'll say, Coxie, is he should have left four years ago. So there's a sense of loyalty with that club with him. I, um, I, I must admit, like I said, he's been loyal and that is probably yeah. one thing that yeah. is in, in Tottenham's favour. He's very loyal. I mean, listen, he's got a missus, he's got kids and he, they're all set or whatever, but... Yeah. Uh, he, he, the interview I saw, it might have been a couple of days ago. I don't know who he done it with, but he kept saying every other. Uh, Spurs, is he? Is he just cutting out? Is it me? No, 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 he's cutting out. Yeah, it's cutting out. Coxie? But... Yeah, I'm here, mate. Hello. Yeah, go, mate. So you. you oh, sorry, mate. Right? No, I was just saying that if. Um, you know, if you're him, he kept saying in an interview that he, you know, he wants to win trophies, and he's not going to do that at Spurs. Yeah, I mean, you're right in saying he's probably one of the best strikers in the world, and I never thought I'd hear myself saying that he is. Um, and it would be disappointing for him when he looks back on his career if he doesn't win Champions League or a league. Um, as he said, as he said in that interview, you spoke about it's okay winning all those individual awards, but. You want to be holding trophies at the end of the year, so it, it is worrying. Um, but that loyalty he's shown to Tottenham, I think that's the only reason, the only question I have at, at the moment whether or not he will leave or not. And he won all; he's won all those individual awards, right? In that team, just think what he can do yeah. in a man. I mean, it's it's crazy how good he is. He, they are a one-man team. I'm not, you know, I'm not mucking about. If he's not in the team. In any team in the Premier League, I don't see any other team affected as much as Spurs. They just do not 
function at all without him in that team. Boxy, think about it this way: if you sell, if Harry Kane goes, yeah, say for, say for for instance, one hundred and twenty million, the club that buys him is not going to get that money back. That's that's also what clubs are going to be thinking about. And then you're looking at the two other strikers. Yeah. yeah, but they might not get it back in revenue, but they might get it back in titles, trophies. Yeah, yeah. But the, the problem I have with these clubs at the moment is a lot of them actually looking at that financial side as well as the yeah. trophies as well. And then yeah. you're looking at someone like Mbappe, um, and then you're looking at the other one who plays for um, Thingy as well, what's his name? Yeah, you're looking at those two. Mm. Could you get them two for the same price you get him? That's going to be, do you know what I mean? And I'm not sure. Club. I think Lukaku's up for. Up yeah, for and Lukaku. Mm. Yeah, and what's Lukaku? I think Lukaku's about 27, isn't he? Is he 27? Well, this is what, that was my next thing. Harry Kane, you know, he's at an age now. If he don't go soon, then people are going to think, oh, you know, don't want to invest that much money, not going to get yeah. his prime years. Yeah. Like, that's why I said the times now, and I don't know what he's saying at all, but, you know, it would be doing my head in playing for Spurs if I, if, it, if I was him. Listen, they pay him great money, but the kid just wants to win stuff. He, the money doesn't come into it, you know. He get whatever wages he gets. He, he wants to win. He wants to win trophies. And and I think Mourinho, I think Mourinho's killed him at Tottenham. I think playing the way he's played all year for Tottenham, the style of football, I think that's probably pushed these buttons. Um, that Still defensive top, style top and, top and say that again. Top goal scorer. And I think yeah, but uh, but if you look at his games, the way he plays, sometimes he looks he looks depressed yeah. when when he was playing for for as he said before. I, I think it's okay getting the top goals and that, but he's done that the whole of his career. I think it's now about dominating Europe, um, yeah. playing in cha- champ Champions League teams. That he should be playing in, in Champions League with the quality. Yeah. Um. Yeah. It, it, it'd be interesting. I think, as Coxie said, I think you're right, Coxie. This is the year, I think, if he doesn't go this year, I think people will be looking at it like he's 20, was he 29, 28? Um, is it worth yeah. buying him for all that money? Yeah. Well, this is all we've got time for today. So, firstly, I'd like to thank Kevin and Coxie, as always, for joining me. <laughs> Secondly, I'd like to thank Charlie Daniels for joining us, telling us a little bit about your career and obviously getting involved in some of the conversation. Obviously, best of luck for yourself and your game against Wimbledon tomorrow but obviously Saturday for the that has just gone for the listeners listening if you're listening on YouTube if you're listening on Twitter take care I wish you all the best and until next time goodbye this is the attacking duo show with Jake Murphy Dean Cox and Kevin Lisby this is a Jake Murphy media production <laughs>